Hello and welcome to another tour here on Free Tours by Foot. Today I am in Nottingham, England. My name is Ian and I'm going to be your guide for this walk through the centre of Nottingham. And if you enjoyed this tour, there are links down in the description where you can buy me a coffee or a pint. You'll also find a link to my website with IAB Tours as well as my YouTube channel where you can find more walks like this. So we, we start our tour today outside a pub. I, honestly, I, I haven't been in there. It's not open yet. <laughs> this is a 1930s pub built by one of the local breweries here in Nottingham in Art Deco style. Uh, so beautiful 1930s Art Deco building. And we're in a part of town that is definitely one of Nottingham's centres of nightlife and entertainment. Uh, it's an area that we call Hockley. Uh, and it's an area that at one time was very much an industrial area going back into the 19th century when the big industry around here was the textile industry, hosiery and particularly lace manufacture. And we're going to be finding out a little bit more about that very shortly. But over the last 20 years or so, this area has really been gentrified and a lot of new bars and restaurants and cafes have opened up here, a lot of street art. It's definitely known as one of the more fashionable areas of Nottingham. Some people call it Nottingham's answer to Soho, referencing the kind of alternative capital area of London. So the building here is called the Broadway Cinema. This street is called Broad Street. And this is Nottingham's leading independent and art house cinema it's been here since the 1980s promotes everything from relatively mainstream films through to art house type films and particularly associated with the nottingham born filmmaker shane meadows who premieres all of his new films there and helps to promote upcoming local talent so this is very much an area that we associate with independent shops, alternative fashion uh, and this whole vibe of the area is the reason why in 2014 a company called Rough Trade decided to open a branch here. Now Rough Trade began life in the 70s as a record shop in London uh, and became a record label, independent record label most famous for introducing the Smiths to the world in the 1980s. Uh, Rough Trade now still is a record shop and upstairs they have a bar and a space where concerts take place. Um, they, they do still have several record shops, including the largest record shop in New York City, actually, but uh, they've been here in Nottingham since 2014. And you see there, look, a yeah, proper old fashioned record store, really great place to go and uh, find some new music and to meet other music enthusiasts as well. And across the way, we have one of the original alternative and retro clothing stores here uh, in this part of Nottingham. Uh, Wild Clothing has been here since 1983. It was run by the original owners until a couple of years ago when they sold it to one of their original clients who took it on as a business. So it was really wild and a couple of other shops around here selling alternative fashions uh, goth fashions, particularly here we can see established 1982 even. Void, very much the shop for goth fashions, certainly during the time I was growing up around here. Um, and it was out of these few shops, an area that people wouldn't generally come to because it was quite run down. But this scene, this alternative scene came along that developed into this area becoming such a a hip area in recent years and uh, the original name in alternative and retro fashion in Nottingham. Um, anybody who grew up here um, at pretty much at any time over the last 30, 40 years will know this one. Established 1979, Ice Nine uh, and uh, really the, the only reason that anybody would ever have come down this part of town um, during the time when I was growing up. Um, because there were a lot of closed up former industrial businesses and so on. Now the buildings over here are testament to a much older part 
of Nottingham's history. And uh, this is a, a shop, set of shops that have been renovated, but they were originally built in the middle of the 19th century, Hockley Lanes. And particularly of interest right here on the end, because the blue plaque that stands there tells us that this was the original shop of John Boot, whose son Jesse took on their family business. They started out here as a medicine shop selling herbal remedies to the poor working class people here working in the textile industry who could not afford to see doctors. And the Boot family opened a chemist shop here back in 1849. And the son Jesse Boot developed that, started opening more shops, started producing medicines on a more industrial scale. Uh, nowadays, uh, Boots has 3,000 shops. It's one of the biggest names, most famous names on UK high streets, Boots the Chemist. Uh, and they operate around 3,000 shops in several countries and they employ about 60,000 people. And if you come to Nottingham, pretty much uh, anybody you meet who is local, um, someone they know, someone in their family will at some stage probably have worked for Boots in one capacity or another. Now we're taking a little shortcut here up a, a little alleyway called Angel Alley. We don't meet many angels, but it does bring us out to a pub called the Old Angel, which we'll see very shortly. But what we also see here is some great examples of street art. Uh, a lot of that put here a few years ago when Nottingham hosted a big international street art festival and the mural we can see there across the car park with the pigeons and the McDonald's cup and the donut um, by a local artist called Booster who does a lot of work involving birds and we also have on this wall a great piece by another local Nottingham street artist called Kid 30 and Kid 30 his murals we'll see another one later they mix up aspects of different characters from popular culture. So here we've got a mixture of British cartoon character Andy Cap, Homer Simpson and Garfield the Cat, all characters that are known for being lazy in pop culture. Uh, and the reason for that is supposed to be that when Kid 30 was a young lad, he grew up in a very poor background. He didn't have, they didn't have a TV, so he kind of knew some of the names of pop culture figures but he used to get them mixed up at school. Um, and, you know, all the other kids knew all the, the, the people in popular culture. He didn't know them and he used to get them mixed up and he made that into the subjects of his artwork. And he's a really successful street artist, not just in Nottingham, but in running street art schools and promoting street art by young people. So I said Angel Alley because it leads to this pub, one of Nottingham's iconic pubs nowadays, also a microbrewery. Uh, the Angel, or the Old Angel as it's often called, um, is a very old building. It's been here for many years, many centuries in fact. I would venture that there are not many buildings anywhere in the world that over their history have been a chapel, a brothel, a police station and a pub. But the Angel has. Nowadays it's a pub though. And we're really coming here into the area that we call the lace market. So lace manufacture became massive in Nottingham in the 19th century. It became one of the international centres for lace making. And the lace market was not where the lace was actually produced from, from the beginning. Uh, that tended to happen at large industrial plants on the outskirts of the town. But this is where the decoration of the lace, the very beautiful decorative elements of the lace were created and it's where the lace manufacturers had their showrooms and so on. And this building belonged to one of the best known lace manufacturers called Adams and Pages. It's called the Adams Building, one of the most beautiful Victorian industrial buildings in the Midlands. In more recent times uh, it has been the home to a college called uh, Nottingham College. It used to be New College Nottingham um, which teaches vocational skills like crafts, art and design, cooking and uh, so a lot of chefs have trained there working at the college restaurant which is called Adam's Restaurant. So textile making was a big 
huge part of the Nottingham economy in the 19th century. Also helped to give rise to one of the prevailing myths about Nottingham that I always used to uh, have uh, raised when I moved away from here um, when I was a teenager. Uh, and that was that uh, there were more women than men in Nottingham. And the, uh, the proportion varied depending on who you were talking to and uh, how many drinks they'd had. But you'd get questions like, Isn't, is it true that in Nottingham there's two women to every man? Three, four, five, you know, you get the picture. And the reason for that was because the main industry you would find close to the city centre was this textile industry. And an awful lot of women worked in that industry, even before women in the workplace was such a widespread thing. So a lot of people who came to Nottingham, if they only came to the city, they'd see a lot of women compared to other places because the men were working in factories or in the coal mines further outside the centre of town. We had a lovely sign representing some of the beautiful decorative lace the kind of thing you might have found being produced here. And these really are great Victorian industrial buildings. Look at the one here on the corner. This one was particular was designed by Watson Fothergill, who was one of Nottingham's best known architects, very distinctive style of architecture. And we can see that you have the the main section of the building, which is nice, but uh, fairly functional. That's where the production and the decoration of the lace would have gone on. And then you have the really ornate section on the corner, which is where the management would have gone and where they would have welcomed their customers. You would have people who might work their entire career, 50 years in the lace making, and they would never go through that main entrance on the corner because they were not management or customers. So the architect of the Adams building that we saw was a man named Heinz. And uh, he was the leading designer of these industrial buildings back in the mid 19th century. And this street, Broadway, was a street where almost all of the buildings were designed by him for the various lace companies. In the last 20 years, the lace market has had a resurgence as quite a, a trendy area in terms of places to eat and drink. And also a lot of the old industrial buildings have been converted into apartments. Uh, so it's been a, become a place that a lot of young professionals, there's a lot of students live around here. Uh, and it's uh, quite a sort of a popular residential area, very close to the absolute centre of the city and uh, you see one of the things they tried to do is reproduce lace type designs in the stonework here and that's what Heinz was, was very very good at. So it's great that these fantastic Victorian industrial buildings because they really did build not only to be practical, but also to impress. You know, this was a time when people were largely, a lot of people were illiterate still. So to advertise your company and to show off the quality and uh, importance of your business, the way to do that would be to build impressive structures and to have fantastic decoration that would be memorable and distinctive. But in the 1970s, you know, there was a big plan to basically demolish all of the old industrial buildings here. But luckily, local authorities and developers saw the potential of this area for other purposes. And that's why we're very fortunate to still have so much of the lace market today. Now, this unassuming and actually quite run down building was once part of a theatre the original, the oldest theatre in Nottingham, the Theatre Royal from the 18th century. But it was demolished in the middle of the 19th century when a brand new, much larger Theatre Royal was built, which remains one of the main theatres in the city to this day. And talking of the theatre, uh, one of the uh, actors who appeared a lot at that theatre, one of the best known actors of his day, was a man by the name of Edmund Keane particularly known for his Shakespearean portrayals and we have a pub named after him here 
close to that theatre where he would once have performed. It's depicted here in the famous scene from Hamlet with the skull, the Keen's Head, um, a well-known pub particularly for people who are interested in craft and real ales and uh, as you might be able to see on the sign over 120 world beers in bottles so it really is a, um, a beer lovers paradise these days it's owned by one of the city's best known breweries a brewery called Castle Rock and right next to it is Nottingham's oldest and largest church now Nottingham does not have a Church of England cathedral it has a Catholic cathedral but not a Church of England cathedral. And so this church, St Mary's in the Lace Market, uh, is the largest church. It is seen as kind of the principal church of the city. Um, there's been a church here for over a thousand years because this part of the city was the original settlement, the Anglo-Saxon town that was first located on this hill where we now find the Lace Market. But most of the structure we see today dates back to the 14th and 15th centuries. It was modelled on Gloucester Cathedral, one of the finest examples of English Gothic church architecture. The tower 39 metres high and uh, still a major landmark because it is on a hill. Um, you'll see a little bit later that we are on a hill, it is a little bit windy as well. I'm um, make, trying to keep pushing my hat down on my head, make sure I don't lose it. And St Mary's Church, very much uh, still an important church within the, the city and what we also see in this part of the city is a reflection of the prosperity of the textile industry now I said that over where we began you had a lot of areas where very poor people lived who worked in these industries uh, and who couldn't afford doctors that's why the boots company began but here this is the kind of places where the owners of some of these businesses and the people who were designing and selling the lace uh, would have been living. These are very typical 18th century townhouses that reflect the uh, prosperity of the city of Nottingham at that particular time. Also here at St Mary's Church we have one of the important war memorials. It's originally a First World War memorial and not only do we have the main memorial with the cross here uh, but this is a war memorial first world war memorial for the entire county of nottinghamshire uh, and what you have here is a list of all the towns and villages in the county of nottinghamshire and how many of their people actually were killed fighting in world war one so for example the town where i grew up is this one hucknall in nottinghamshire 260 men from Hucknall died fighting in the First World War. Now reflecting the fact that this was the original site of Nottingham settlement is the fact that its seat of justice and the seat of the administration of the uh, town and later of the county was here up until relatively recent times and the building here is called the Shire Hall and the Crown Court. Uh, it uh, acted as an administrative centre until the late 19th century. So this building actually comes from the 18th century but there's been a, an administrative building and a court and a jail on this site since at least the 1400s. So it's a uh, and it was the main criminal court in Nottingham until 1991. Nowadays it's got a fantastic museum, the National Justice Museum, all about the history of crime and punishment. Absolutely fascinating place to visit if you are ever in Nottingham. I just want to point out something to you that always makes me smile. So we have um, the entrance to the jail. Now the old spelling of jail in this in English of course G A O L but somebody actually misspelt it so originally you might be able to make out that said G O A L and they just recarved the correct spelling over the top so originally that didn't say county jail it said county goal uh, I'm not sure actually how many people's goal it was to end up in there not many I would have thought right here on the steps of the Shire Hall 
This is where, until the 1860s, public executions would have taken, would have taken place. Public hangings, so the criminals would be tried in the building, be held in the jail, and then they would, if they were sentenced to death, they would be executed here in front of the Shire Hall, and there'd have been a crowd gathered to watch the uh, public executions. It was what passed for entertainment in those days. And directly adjacent to the court building is the original Victorian police station with the, uh, the blue lamp. So this is kind of an original feature of police stations from the 19th century. So even if you watch, say, a Sherlock Holmes movie, the police station would have a lamp like this in, in front of it. It's a, it's a very traditional feature that has been preserved here. It's no longer a police station, hasn't been for many years. And uh, we see here another piece of street art by Kid 30. So again, here he's mixing up things from popular culture. Uh, Rafiki, the, the monkey from the Lion King movie. Uh, also, Coco is a monkey advertising Coco Pops breakfast cereal on TV here in the UK. So he's mixing up all of these uh, pop culture references in these really quirky but really distinctive works of art. Now we can't have a tour of mine without having a, an important building with construction work going on on it. That's exactly what we've got here with the scaffolding on this beautiful church. This church was built in the 1860s. Fantastic Victorian church built as the Unitarian Chapel. Uh, but it has a very different purpose these days. Uh, the, chap the church itself closed and uh, for a number of years it was a visitor centre for the lace market and now it is a bar, a bar and restaurant. But it's a very sympathetic restoration. They've kept some of the beautiful stained glass windows from the 19th century and uh, a lot of the uh, design of the interior of the building is intact. So from 19th century architecture we come right up to date with a piece of modern architecture. This is a gallery, a modern art gallery called the Nottingham Contemporary. Uh, it was built in 2007 and it's one of the country's leading centres for modern art, for contemporary art. Uh, it was designed by the architect Caruso St. John and uh, it is actually, it looks quite a plain metallic design. It uses the slope of the land so it's actually much, much bigger than it appears because the ground slopes away and it's got several stories. But it's much cleverer in the design than you first think because as we go closer, what you can see is that in this aluminium design, this looks like lace. And it's a reference to the lace market and they've actually used a pattern developed by one of the major lace businesses here back in the 19th century. So a really smart design here on the contemporary art building. And uh, according to archeologists, what they've discovered, this was where the original Anglo-Saxon fortification, so around 1300 years ago, this was where the original settlement in Nottingham took place on raised ground, looking out southwards over the valley of the River Trent. And uh, certainly in medieval times, this would have been the centre of the town uh, and what we can see with the steps just across the way there is a modern replica of what would have been the medieval market cross. So this would have been the main marketplace of the original settlement of Nottingham. It was, this was the settlement that would have been taken over. It was conquered by Vikings in the year 868. So Nottingham was part of of England that was ruled by Danes and uh, this is where the weekday market would have taken place and this junction here is known to this day as Weekday Cross. So the original settlement up here on the one hill and when England was conquered by the Normans in the 11th century they came to Nottingham and they decided they wanted to build a castle here because it was such a great strategic location right in the heart of England. And so they built a, a castle here and they built it on another hill quite close to the original settlement and what that meant was that you for many years had then two settlements. You had what were called 
the English town, which is where we've just been behind us. And then on the other side of the city, where we're going to finish our tour by the castle, um, we had what was known as the French town. And obviously, the settlements started to grow over time and started to merge. And so the centre of Nottingham today is in the dip, the little valley between these two hills that were originally the French and English settlements. Now the street we're walking along is called Middle Pavement and there's a series of streets here, high pavement, middle pavement and low pavement as you go down the hill. Uh, and the reason they have that name, that pavement, is because this is the first roads in Nottingham that were actually paved. And that's because a lot of wealthy people lived along here in the 18th century. They built houses like this one. Now this is a grand 18th century building, um, but it's called Vault Hall. These days there's a lovely restaurant in there. The reason it's be called Vault Hall is because like many of the buildings in Nottingham city centre, it has underneath it caves. Nottingham is built on porous sandstone rock. And the first ever reference to a settlement here was in the eighth century, a monk, a Welsh monk writing, and they called this Tigerochaboch, which meant in their language, the place of caves, because this sandstone for thousands of years has been excavated and people have lived in it, worked in it, and many of the buildings in Nottingham have caves underneath them. There are more than 500 caves still remaining to this day. Now here's another lovely 18th century building called Willoughby House. These days it is the flagship store of a Nottingham-born fashion designer, Paul Smith, particularly known for his men's fashion. Uh, he grew up in Nottingham and made his name in the fashion industry and uh, has always maintained very good links with his uh, hometown and so he has his flagship store here in this beautiful building on Middle Pavement uh, and actually uh, at the Broadway cinema where we began our tour uh, one of their four screens was actually designed by Paul Smith so he, he turned his hand from fashion to a little bit of interior decor. Now we're turning here onto a very ancient street. This is called Bridlesmith Gate. Now this word gate, it doesn't mean we're going to go through a gate like a doorway. Gate was the old Scandinavian word for a street. Uh, and that shows us that this was in the part of England ruled by the Vikings. Uh, so you find a lot of street names with this word gate. And if you go up to the north of England, to York, for example, uh, you will find a lot of streets with that name in them as well. Bridlesmith Gate, so Bridlesmith, people making bridles and equipment for horses, was the traditional trade that would have been going on along here. Certainly this street has been here for about 700 years, and it was once one of the main roads through the city. In fact, it was part of the main route that went from London all the way up to the north of England, to Yorkshire. So that is why people making equipment for horses and later carriages would have been on this street because that's where the travellers were going, passing through the city. It's also where there would have been a lot of coaching inns, places for travellers to stay. But also buildings from the 19th century like this one, which was a municipal administration building. Uh, from the 19th century. Now, as you can see, like many of the buildings here, designer shopping, Hugo Boss in this case. And this has been quite a, an important shopping street since more modern roads started to be built in the 19th century. Uh, and so this became a very important shopping street. And if we were to go back to the late Victorian age, Nottingham at, at one time had 10 street lamps, gas street lamps, and five of them were on this one street. So that kind of shows how important this street was, how much the commerce here and the businesses that were running on Bridlesmith Gate, how important they were still in the life of a city in the 19th century. And we're going to uh, turn off Bridlesmith Gate very briefly. But you can also see that a lot of the 
alleyways that would have been probably quite unpleasant hundreds of years ago. They've been converted into covered passageways where there are nice shops and places to eat and drink, little hideaways. And really, uh, they've really used the, the medieval street plan of the city with, with great effect here. And we're going to uh, take a look at uh, one of the oldest buildings in this part of town in a moment. Now we saw the, the oldest church in Nottingham, St Mary's in the Lace Market. And actually on this tour we're going to see the oldest three churches. So uh, St Mary's, the oldest. And in a moment we're going to see St Peter's. And I've just turned on to St Peter's. That's the name of this street. We can see grand 19th century buildings again. This is when Nottingham really grew, became a prosperous place because of its uh, because of its textile industry, because of its location with transportation and um, hospitality, and also because to the north of the county of Nottinghamshire were coal mines. So there was a lot of very wealthy people making money from all of these industries around here. And uh, that's why the city grew up as a reputation of being an attractive city. And it still has it to this day. Um, known as a great place for shopping, a great place for nightlife and um, a very pleasant place to live. Also a big student city. Two major universities here within Nottingham and students make up a, a sizeable proportion of the population. So this is St Peter's Church. Dates back to the 12th century originally and was later added to. So the tower 12th century, the spire was added later. Uh, the interior of the church was quite significantly damaged during the English Civil War in the 1640s uh, because uh, some of the troops, as the fighting spread from the castle into the streets, uh, they thought that they could actually uh, go and uh, take shelter in the church and their enemies wouldn't pursue them. But uh, unfortunately they, they misjudged things because their enemies did pursue them uh, and uh, that caused quite a lot of damage to the interior of the church, which subsequently had to be renovated. Now, the other thing that's a good reason to come down St. Peter's Street is that we get our first view of Nottingham's, probably Nottingham's most iconic building. And that is the huge domed classical structure of Nottingham Council House. And uh, we're going to see it very close up soon and we're going to get another lovely view of it as well from across the main market square. But this is, gives you an idea when you're approaching Nottingham from any direction pretty much from way outside the city you can see this dome 61 metres high uh, and this huge dome resembles St Paul's Cathedral in London as, as was uh, the intention of the architect. But uh, this is a civic building not a religious building. So we see more fantastic 19th century commercial buildings, in this case from the 1870s. Would originally have been several smaller premises, but now most of that building is taken up by the bookshop, Waterstones Bookshop. This is one of their biggest branches. We're making our way really into the heart of the modern city. The place where these two towns that were originally here, the English and French towns, where they met. And uh, we're going to see another piece of, a uh, little piece of Nottingham history, if you like. Uh, we saw a little bit earlier on where the original store of Boots the Chemist was located. But uh, in the early 20th century, Boots the Chemist expanded and they decided they didn't just want to be a chemist shop. They would kind of be a department store selling cosmetics and, and all kinds of other products. You know, when, when I was growing up, they sold records and electronic equipment, photographic equipment. Um, and the original department stores that they had often also included a restaurant. And one of the other things they often included was a library where people could go and actually borrow books. Because this was in the area where public libraries were not so widespread. 
and this gave people a great place to go and buy books. And this building was the original model for these large stores, boots department stores. This building in Art Nouveau style, 1903 designed here in the Boots home city and uh, you can see this fantastic metalwork and stonework of the, the entranceway there. Still now a fashion store but uh, back then the Boots store with its restaurant, its library and so on. And as I said, Boots is very much a part of the, the city's identity. Um, my parents met working in a Boots store many years ago and uh, you know most people know someone who has worked at Boots. Now we're going to go down a little street whose name takes us right back to the medieval agricultural markets. But before we do that, we're going to come right up to date because we've got the trams. Nottingham uh, built a, a new tram network in the early 2000s. Extended, originally went to the north of the city, extended to the south a few years ago. Uh, and they have 37 trams in the fleet and each one of them is named after a prominent person born in or with connections to Nottingham and they can be nominated by the public. So you have famous figures from the world of sports, entertainments, charity, philanthropy, medicine uh, and so on, with, with trams named after them. It's a very typical building of the 19th century but it's on a street and above a little walkway called Poultry Arcade. And this street is still to this day called Poultry. And Poultry because this is where poultry would have been sold in medieval agricultural markets of Nottingham. And that is preserved right up to the modern day in the name of the street. So it's amazing that these names persist through the centuries because of course uh, the only poultry you're going to be buying down here these days is, uh, well, something in one of the restaurants or maybe even in Burger King you might be able to get some poultry. Uh, but what we do have on this street is a building that's a beautiful example of a medieval inn. So this would have been a, a pub, a restaurant, a place with rooms for travellers to stay in. It's called the Flying Horse. Established in 1483. It's one of those very, very helpful buildings that has the date when it was built on the front, so we don't have to remember it. 1483. And this remained in operation as a licensed premises, a pub and hotel until the 1980s. And uh, it is still, does have a restaurant in there, but part of the complex has been made into a sort of a an arcade for designer shopping and in 1815 they held a huge banquet and party in the flying horse uh, to celebrate victory over Napoleon and they actually had a, an effigy of Napoleon sent up from London in a stagecoach and after the banquet they took it out onto the market square of Nottingham and burnt the effigy of Napoleon and apparently the the Nottingham crowds of 1815 they loved that kind of thing they loved them some burning of Napoleon effigies and they came out in great numbers to, to watch this. Uh, something that I can't I quite imagine today. Now we're going into a building that we saw the council house dome from a little way away. Well here we are underneath it. Underneath the dome here look and Part of the building, the council house, is the, still the city's administrative building, used for a lot of ceremonial purposes. But we have, as well, a shopping arcade here, which is called the Exchange Arcade, because the building that the council house replaced in the 1920s was a mid-19th century building called the Exchange, which was a centre for trade and commerce. Uh, and that tradition is carries on in, in this lovely retail arcade today. So let's take a look up to the dome because what we also have are four murals from 1928 and they show scenes from the history of Nottingham. This one shows the Vikings arriving here in 868. 
And then we come around here, what do we come to? We come to William the Conqueror, William the First, deciding to build a castle here in 1067. Over here we have something that, uh, well, maybe not history, but the man who is probably the most famous person associated with Nottingham, Robin Hood, of course, and more of him in a little while. And on this side, King Charles I, who raised his flag in Nottingham at the castle to mark the onset of the English Civil War. And what the council house is most famous for is its bells. And I'm going to let you listen to them. So the bell we can hear striking. There's a bell called Little John. It is a 10 ton bell that chimes the hour here in Nottingham. 10 ton bell. Maybe I should have done this at one o'clock or two o'clock. <laughs> you, you could have got the idea without it taking too long to listen to the chimes. But that's a, such a part of Nottingham, you know, you're listening to the council house chimes. That is really something that you're immersed in Nottingham because it's something we all know so well and we all just uh, grew up with. And uh, now earlier on, I mentioned a man called Watson Fothergill, a Nottingham based architect. And this is perhaps, I think, one of the finest examples of his work. He had quite an unconventional style of architecture. He combined Tudor, medieval, Victorian, Gothic, arts and crafts into his own quirky style. Uh, and this building here, Queen's Chambers, is one of uh, his most beautiful buildings. He wasn't uh, an architect who did a lot of work outside Nottingham actually. Most of his work was done here in his home city. But uh, there's certainly plenty of places you can pick it out and it is quite distinctive. Now talking of 19th century architects, one of the leading exponents of the Victorian Gothic was an architect by the name of Alfred Waterhouse. And the building we can see in front of us, it's like a kind of a flat iron shape. Um, and it's at a meeting point of several roads here, King Street, and Queen Street are the two roads that meet here. And this building was built for an insurance company uh, back in the 1880s, and Waterhouse was the architect. Now we saw the mural of Robin Hood, and we're going to see a statue of Robin Hood later, but another great hero of Nottingham comes from the sporting field, and he is commemorated with a statue here. This is Mr. Brian Clough OBE, one of England's greatest football or soccer managers came to Nottingham Forest, our local football, one of our local football teams in the 1970s. A mediocre provincial team made them champions of England and back-to-back -back champions of Europe. Celebrated for his idiosyncratic manner, his uh, no-nonsense approach, his also for his insistence on playing attractive, entertaining football and a great hero to many of us sports fans growing up uh, in Nottingham. He spoilt us though, because we grew up with Nottingham Forest winning national titles, European titles, and then, yeah, and then that's it for the rest of your sporting fan life <laughs> as they struggle again for many years afterwards. But uh, Brian Clough's statue was erected. He passed away in 2004, actually. As always, entertainment going on around the Market Square. And we got a lovely 
view of the council house from here. And I'm going to show you a very iconic spot in Nottingham. Oh, a bit of Amy Winehouse. Here at the front of the council house are two lions. They're known officially as Agamemnon and Menelaus, after important names from Greek mythology, but they were designed like all of the artworks on the front of the council house by Joseph Else. And these lions have been the meeting point for Nottingham people for a hundred years. If you're going on a date, where do you meet? You meet at the lions particularly the left lion, for some reason, has become the meeting point of people in Nottingham over the years. And I'd suggest that a sizable proportion of Nottingham's population owe their existence to the fact that on some evening, their parents met here at the lions. And we are standing on what is known as the Old Market Square. So we've got a great view of the council house again, and the lions. And the market square here in Nottingham, not being used for anything today really, but uh, it's the venue for markets, for events, for entertainments at various points during the year. It's actually the largest surviving medieval market square in England. And I mentioned a couple of times that Nottingham was originally two towns on two hills, and this was right in the centre of them, where the markets grew up. And they were divided, those two settlements, by a wall. And this marking and where the drainage system runs here through the centre of the market square actually marks the course of that boundary wall between the two original settlements of Nottingham. So that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting throwback to the history. The steps here, well in the, in the summertime this is a fountain designed and installed by the same people who created the uh, Diana Memorial Fountain in London. So it's on a warm day or this being England it doesn't even have to be that warm a day really. Um, you find a lot of uh, people sitting bathing their feet in the fountain or kids playing in the fountain. This creates a nice little uh, little atmosphere within the city here. Now what we will get from the far end of the market square here is a great view back towards the council house where we'll get our, our best view of it. I want to show you that before we move on. So here this is the great view of the market square and the council house despite how it looks it's not that old it was only built in the 1920s completed in 1929 uh, and it was built by the city architect a man by the name of Howitt and uh, they did consider bringing in sort of quite a big name architect from somewhere but uh, he insisted he was up to the job because this was a construction project on a scale that he'd never even attempted before you know but actually he was ridiculed quite a bit because in the 1920s this style of classical architecture was completely out of fashion you know people were building in much more modern styles art deco and so on and he was actually quite ridiculed for this classical building but over the years of course as we've taken much more of an interest in historic styles of architecture it has become much more well recognised as, as a great building. And we heard, of course, the chimes of the 10 ton bell that sounds to the hour. One of the most iconic chimes, probably uh, beaten only by Big Ben down in London. To get across the tram tracks quickly here before. Tram, the, we're very. The, at the moment, the, the trams are not running a full service. They've got some issues. So it's much easier than normal to cross the, the tram lines. 
and we're going to head up towards the district where we can find Nottingham Castle. So we began in the original Anglo-Saxon settlement and so the English town and now we are heading up into the French town as it was called and we're going to be walking along Friar Lane. Now there are many people who visit Nottingham and probably lots of local people as well who think that this might be called Friar Lane after Friar Tuck, one of the great figures of course from the Robin Hood legend, especially because the road it leads on to is called Maid Marian Way, but that's not actually the case. This has been called Friar Lane for many centuries because at one time where we have the modern buildings in front of us, uh, there was a medieval monastery and so it's named after the friars, the monks who were living and working at the monastery here on this site. So nothing to do with a much beloved figure of Friar Tuck. This is a, an area of the town that was massively redeveloped uh, in the post World War II period. Uh, some of the time that was because of repairing damage due to bombing, but it was also due to tastes and wanting to uh, create a more modern city. But there was a lot of very historic parts of Nottingham that were destroyed by the city planners in the 1950s, 60s. Uh, and so uh, there's still quite a lot of bad feeling among certain sections of the population who um, wished that maybe the modernization had been a little bit more sympathetic and had incorporated more of the historic cityscape than it did. So we're going to turn on to the interestingly named Spaniel Row. So not often you get a not often you get a street named after a breed of dog, but uh, here we are on Spaniel Row. Uh, but strangely enough, here on the corner of Spaniel Row, uh, we have a cat cafe and some huge cats <laughs> smiling and waving at us on the murals. Um, so, no spaniels chasing them. And we're going to head towards one of Nottingham's most historic pubs. Now there are a number of pubs in Nottingham that claim vastly ancient lineage and we're going to end our tour at one that claims to be the oldest pub in England uh, but it's not, it's not even the oldest pub in Nottingham <laughs> but uh, still they are very ancient hostelries and the one we're going to look at it has a name that comes from a, a biblical reference that is linked to the fact it was close to the monastery that I mentioned. Uh, it was originally called it was quite a, a, you know, you wouldn't quickly say I'm just popping down to the for a pint because it was called the Gabriel Salutes the Virgin Mary. That was the picture depicted on the sign. Uh, and this inn was definitely in operation by the 1300s. The build, parts of the building itself are much older than that. Uh, the date that they give as a publicity thing is 1240. Uh, certainly parts of the building date back to that date, but there's no evidence of it being used as a, a pub until the 1300s when uh, there's a record in the, the royal accounts that uh, one of the kings was staying at Nottingham Castle and some of his retainers stayed here and it's referred to, um, I said, Gabriel saluting the Virgin Mary. It's referred to in the royal accounts that the, these retainers stayed at the sign of the salutation. So uh, that's the first reference we have to this name. It's called the Old Salutation Inn or to local people just the Old Sal or the Sal. It is still a pub and it's also well known for rock music. So lots of uh, rock music nights have been held here over the years. Nothing to do with the, the Angel Gabriel on the sign these days. Just a uh, people shaking hands and greeting one another. But the, the, this is another building that has caves underneath it. So the pub cellar uh, is a cave underneath the pub, which uh, is actually over two stories. It has two stories of cave cellars underneath the pub, reputed to be a very haunted spot. And it's somewhere that features on a lot of the, the ghost hunts and those kinds of events 
uh, that took place within the city. So I mentioned a street named after the wife of Robin Hood, Maid Marian Way, a modern street, and we're crossing it now. Uh, but what we're also going to do is look back because we're going to see the third oldest church in Nottingham. We've seen the oldest two. This is St. Nicholas, originally built in the late 13th century, but heavily restored. The reason for its heavy restoration was because during the English Civil War, the uh, parliamentary army put some of its cannons and artillery on top of the church tower, because from there they could bombard Nottingham Castle. And of course, that cannon fire was returned. And so the uh, church sustained quite significant damage and had to be heavily restored. But it is the third oldest church foundation in Nottingham. We have another street called a gate here. In this case, Castle Gate. Uh, we can't guess where that leads to. This is a street largely built in the late 17th, early 18th centuries. One of its grandest buildings is this one. And uh, this building is now, it's called Newdigate House and it was built in 1674 and uh, later modernized in the 18th century. Uh, and it was known because after the Battle of Blenheim between England and France in the early 18th century, um, one of the French commanders, Marshal Tallard, was actually taken prisoner and rather than keep him in London where he'd attract a lot of attention they kept him here as a kind of a prisoner I suppose a hostage uh, in Nottingham and this is where he stayed because of course you have a, a leading aristocratic military commander who you've captured you don't lock him in a dungeon and throw away the key you treat him as an honoured guest just that he can't leave and this is where Marshal Tallard um, stayed in the early 18th century. Um, these days within the building is a Michelin starred restaurant, so one of the city's best, it's called World Service. And we can see there, the red Michelin sign from the latest issue of the Michelin Guide. So up ahead of us, we can see parts of the walls of Nottingham Castle. Now Nottingham Castle began, now there may have been some kind of settlement, early settlement, because it's on such a strategic position. It's on a 45 metre high crop of red sandstone with fantastic views out, particularly to the south over the valley of the River Trent. So a strategic position for anyone to build a military fortification to control trade and traffic and what's going on in the surrounding area. So the original castle here would have been a wooden structure built in 1067 by King William I. Over the years though, rebuilt in stone and vastly extended. And the walls we see in front of us there, they are 13th century walls. And in front of them we can see Robin Hood. Now we're going to go and look at Robin Hood a little bit more closely in a moment. But there's a couple of other things I want to show you. First of all, one of them here. Another building by that uh, architect whose work we've seen a couple of times, Watson Fothergill. And uh, the restaurant that's in this building now has actually been named after him, Fothergill's. And we have, fittingly for a building next to the castle, a really ancient structure. Now this building originally dates back to the 15th century, but it did not originally stand on this site. It was originally right in the heart of the city, but was due to be demolished during the 1960s and was saved, but it was taken down and lovingly reconstructed here next to the castle. It's called Seven's House. It's for sale at the moment as office accommodation, which is what it's been in recent years. The Seven, uh, that was a family who owned the house for many, many generations, running a beer and wine merchants. So they were the owners of that building before it was moved over here. So before we come back to old Robin, let's uh, take a little wander up towards the front of the castle, shall we? And uh, throughout the medieval period, Nottingham Castle was pretty much an impregnable royal fortress. So numerous kings of England 
stayed here, used it as a defensive position in times of conflict, it was a safe haven where they knew they and their families would be safe because it was so, such a well defended place. And so we get an idea of that here. Look at these 13th century walls and the gatehouse dating back to 1251 with uh, some uh, obviously later restoration work. But people who come to Nottingham because of the Robin Hood legends and because they might have read that this was such an important royal fortress in the medieval period, they expect a medieval fortress to be here and to see battlements and towers and, and all of those good things that you expect from a royal castle. And they're a little bit disappointed because that castle was largely destroyed in the Civil War in the 1600s and it was demolished and in its place was built a, an aristocratic palace by a very wealthy man called the Duke of Newcastle and he so for 200 years it was an aristocratic palace in the 1840s it was acquired by the local authority of Nottingham and uh, pretty much ever since then it has been open as a museum and here we're going remember through the gatehouse from the 13th century 1251 where kings and nobles knights and ladies would have come for centuries through this gatehouse towards nottingham castle and they wouldn't have seen a castle that looked like that and this is the the ducal palace the 1670s now as it has been for a long long time a museum art gallery they've recently done a lot of reconstruction and renovation work creating a new robin hood exhibition and much more interactive exhibits for uh, families to enjoy some great gardens and beautiful views over the surrounding area from within the castle grounds so uh, let's go back through this gate again much easier to get in and out than it would have been uh, seven or eight hundred years ago, that's for sure. And certainly much easier to get in and out than it might have been in the stories of the chap who we can get an even better look at from here. So there's Robin Hood. Now, of course, Robin Hood is the most famous person associated with Nottingham. And people often wonder whether Robin Hood was a real person and uh, despite being a proud son of Nottingham and a big fan of Robin Hood and the stories that go with him uh, I have to admit as putting on my historian and uh, honest tour guide hat that uh, to all intents and purposes from everything we know Robin Hood was not a real person uh, like any great heroic figure in legend there's no way that really that one person could have done all of the things that are attributed to him in those stories it's just not feasible but that's not to say that what we find in the robin hood stories is completely invented it's not completely invented fiction because there were outlaw communities now they weren't necessarily criminals an outlaw just meant someone living outside the law in the sense of not being part of regular society. These days we might think of them as being people who lived, say, off the grid. So they weren't registered on the electoral rolls, they maybe didn't pay taxes, but they didn't use up any services either. You know, and they maybe lived in the areas surrounding the towns. So those groups existed. The longbow was the most important weapon for soldiers and hunters in medieval England. So people with the skills of the bow that Robin Hood is depicted as having, they are certainly something that they would have been. And the sheriffs of Nottingham, well, the sheriff was the king's representative in an area and the sheriff of Nottingham was responsible for collecting taxes, for enforcing the laws round about Nottingham. And there was a lot of resistance and bad feeling about some of the harsh tax regimes imposed 
on the local people during medieval times. So there are many elements of the Robin Hood legend that are taken from reality. So let's have a look at this statue because this statue was put here in 1952. It's by James Woodford. And the statue was quite controversial. Well, you know, you look at it and you think, what could be controversial about that? Well, Woodford studied ancient manuscripts and pictures of what someone who lived the kind of life of an outlaw and a hunter and a fighter of Robin Hood's day might have looked like. And he came up with the idea they would have been a very, very strong to have the musculature to be able to live that kind of life, to pull the string of an English longbow. And so he depicted this really strong, I mean, look at his legs, look at his arms and shoulders. But a lot of the people in the early 50s, they were used to seeing Robin Hood to being depicted by Errol Flynn in the movies. And Errol Flynn is quite a slight of build, very slim, quite a small guy. And so people thought, well, he doesn't look like Robin Hood, even though he was perhaps a more accurate historical representation. So uh, he added a couple of details like the cap and some of the, uh, the way the clothing is depicted was changed to be a bit more like the Robin we know from the movies and the, the comic books and all kinds of representations in popular culture. There is still a Sheriff of Nottingham to this day. It is a ceremonial role, a little bit like a mayor, I suppose, um, but they do a lot of ceremonial duties like, uh, you know, giving speeches and welcoming visitors to the city and opening official events and, and so on. So that is a, a position that still remains. In recent decades, um, I remember reading in the newspaper at one time when, the, when we had the first black sheriff of Nottingham, we've had the first Muslim sheriff of Nottingham, you know, it's, uh, so it's very much a, a position that's moved to reflect the society that it, uh, that it serves. And we get another view here as we go down the hill of these amazing castle walls that you can perhaps see why this was such a favoured royal castle because you know with the kinds of weapons available six seven hundred years ago and with people on the top of the wall firing arrows at you throwing spears at you pouring heaven knows what down upon you you are really having your work cut out to try to even think about attacking this castle and into the castle here in castle rock look at this We've got the entrances to some of the caves and we can see brick structures within the caves. These would have been shops, businesses and even people's homes until around the 1860s. It was only in the 1860s that it was actually made by law that people couldn't live in the caves in Nottingham anymore. Although the chances are people still did and they certainly still used the caves for storage, for their businesses and so on. And as we go down the hill and start to really see the castle wall is further and further above us on this outcrop of sandstone. And uh, we get to the bottom of here and we get to the place where we're going to finish. We're going to have a lovely view back up to the castle and Castle Rock. But we're also going to see Nottingham's most famous pub. And I always think uh, if you're going to finish a tour, finish at a pub. And this one is called the Trip to Jerusalem Inn. And the date that appears on the side and on the side of the building, 1189 AD, uh, which they claim makes it the oldest pub in England. Now I have to tell you, there is no evidence that there's been a pub on this site since 1189. There's been a pub on this site definitely for around 400 years, maybe 500. And certainly within the caves underneath the castle and within buildings adjoining them, there would have been brewing going on to supply the people living and the soldiers garrisoned at the castle. So there's a history of brewing down here since way, way back in history. But the actual a pub that is open to the general public, probably around 500 years. Interesting name, the old trip to Jerusalem. And that is because comes from the fact of the Crusades. So um, maybe not a, an episode in history that is looked upon with, uh, with a great deal of uh, 
good regard these days. But trip, it didn't mean a, a journey. You know, we've taken a trip today around Nottingham, but that's not what that word used to mean. A trip used to be a meeting place before a journey. So the idea here would be, this was a royal castle, so people who were going to the Holy Land on crusade would gather from the surrounding area at the castle, and so they would meet, they would stay at an inn near the castle, and then they would go off on the way. So it was the place they stayed before setting out to Jerusalem. And you can see the building disappears into the rock, and some of parts of the, the pub today, you go in there, there are some of the rooms where you actually sit and have your drink or your food in a cave, pretty much cut into the natural rock of Castle Rock, the sandstone here. So still remains a, a fantastic pub, whether it, regardless of the fact that it's not the oldest in England or even the oldest in the city, it is absolutely an iconic spot in Nottingham. And it's a place that uh, I definitely recommend. Um, and uh, it's really, a great atmospheric pub to, to go into. And if we look beyond the construction work going on, we can see how high Castle Rock is. We can see the walls of the uh, Nottingham Castle, the, the 1670s palace up there, and really see how defensible this position was. To the south, you would look out over the valley of the River Trent, nothing would be able to happen in this area without whoever was in the castle seeing it and being able to act if they needed to. So we've had a stroll from the very first area of Nottingham that was settled over a thousand years ago to this area that was controlled by kings and powerful medieval lords and that's associated with one of our best loved, most popular legends. And we're going to finish it at a pub. So I want to say a huge thanks for being with me here in Nottingham today, here on Free Tours by Foot. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this uh, city from different sides and uh, finding out a little bit more about it. I want to thank Free Tours by Foot for asking me to come and do this tour and uh, as always uh, you can check out all of their tours on the YouTube channel uh, and uh, go to all kinds of fascinating places around the world. Uh, you can also find some more of my tours on there to Oxford, to Stratford-upon-Avon and uh, other places coming up too. Now if you want to find out where you can contact me, where you can find out more about other tours that I do, then look in the description below and you can find the links. My channel is um, at, you can look, search for me at IAB Tours. And if you have enjoyed the tour, um, you can find the details there of where you can go to show your appreciation. So without further ado, from me, Ian, here in Nottingham on Free Tours by Foot, thank you very much. Happy traveling, stay safe, and I will see you again sometime, somewhere soon.